Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Spread the gladness all around. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Bear the news to every land. Climb the steeps and cross the waves. Onward tis our Lord's command. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Sing above the battle strife. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. By his death and endless life. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Sing it softly through the gloom. When the heart for mercy craves, sing in triumph for the tomb. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Give the winds a mighty voice. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. And the oceans now rejoice. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Shout salvation, full and free, highest hills and deepest caves. This our song of victory. Jesus saves. Jesus saves. Amen. subject would be uh, science. My favorite subject is art. Yeah, we learn um, um, like coding and stuff. Coding and typing. Help us to type faster. The school began because parents in Karat were looking for an international school that could help their children with English primarily and they knew about the Seventh-day Adventist system. So they came and asked us to start a school here in Karat. Well, you know that we started with 16 children. We only have these two classrooms here. This school is here to let them know about Jesus Christ. One thing that really impressed me about the students were they were so eager to learn, not only English, but they were so eager to learn so many things, especially Bible. Every day they demand me to tell stories about the Bible. This school teaches the Bible, and I like the Bible. I come to know more about Jesus, and then I started to believe in Jesus. We, I have learned many things. Uh, we always read the Bible in the morning, prayed to Him. As a teacher, I'm, I'm trying my best to be a good example. So my contribution is that is introducing God to these young generations, young leaders of Thailand. So my hope and prayer is that they will not forget what they learned and wherever they will go later, they will always remember Jesus and accept Jesus in their hearts. No, I like the whole part of the school, <laughs> everything. Everything that we do here. This school might be small, but Everyone here is friends and we are all friends with each other, so it's like a nice small community. We play together, we help each other, and be kind and share. Because the parents feel that we are giving their children values, working hard to build good characters for them, I would ask for the world community, the church community, to pray that those values will be very effective and that they will be 
of a tremendous benefit to the Thai community. My daughter is more of a leader than before. Now she can explain herself. She can do more than before. I feel like I have become more responsible. This school is like pretty small and I want a bigger school so that we can have places to play and study. Well, we are growing and it's really not enough now. We are struggling. Uh, right now we are sharing a classroom with the teachers. The idea of an international school in Thailand is that it is a very nice place for students to go. The facilities are nice. Our parents understand that we teach good values. But when their friends look at our school, they see something that is not representative of an international school. Some of their friends don't want to send their children to our school because of the facilities not being representative. We would like a new facility because yeah, we are getting bigger and we need some place to hold us. I feel very happy that we will be getting a new building. We will have more for supporting our school. Not only to support the school, if we support the school, it means we are supporting the children. Ames Korat is very special. And I know that God started this school. And I believe that he handpicked each student to be here. And he wants them saved. <laughs> so for me, um, until Jesus comes, this will continue. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. See everybody here today. The what? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> I am a short version of Nathan, if you haven't noticed. Um, yeah, um, Nathan is gone, so. There are a couple of announcements that I want to make. If you look at your bulletin back and front, and the other front and the other back, and you look at the insert, and you look everywhere in your bulletin, you're going to find something missing. Of course, how are you going to find it if it's missing, right? Um, this afternoon, right after our presentation this morning, we are going to have a fellowship dinner. So that's what's missing on our bulletin. Everybody's invited to our fellowship dinner after uh, this morning's message. If you look at your bulletin, though, it says next Sabbath, there is going to be a fellowship meal. But that's not true. So we're not having a fellowship meal next Sabbath on the 27th. We're having it today, which is normal, right? The first and the third Sabbath is when we have our fellowship meals. So that's the announcement I, want to, I wanted to make. We do have another announcement by Karen, so we will let her give her announcements. Happy Sabbath. How do you like this cold weather? Kind of chills the bones, doesn't it? Makes you alive. I have three announcements that are important. Um, the following of the stars that's at the Oregon Conference Campground is on date is November 30th to December 2nd between 8 and 9 or 7 and 9. And it's a walk through a live Navinity scene. But to indicate the date would be best for you or you need a ride, fill this out to be out here just as you go to your right, okay, on the 
put your name on it so we can get this to the conference and let them know we can plug you in so you be able to see it. The next one is the Women of the Bible in Me series begins Thursday the 8th at 2 p.m. and continues for seven weeks. So those ladies who would like to come, here's a paper for you to sign so I can give you a um, It'll be here. Um, and it'll go through the 20, uh, yeah, anyway. Anyhow, so that's all on here. So if you write your name on here and let me know, that way I can give you the lessons, okay? Then, one most important thing. My love and Rusty's love is jail ministry. I found out from the head chief down there that they have an orientation on November 26 at 7 o'clock, which is a Monday. And we need men, okay? The men are forgotten. They only see maybe once a month, the first Sabbath. We have two gentlemen that go in. But they need it as well as the ladies do. So... Those that are interested, even the ladies are interested, because I would be glad to go in with a man to see the men. That was my joy, and it was Rusty's joy to go in and see these men, because they look kind of rough and tough, but hey, they're just like little teddy bears, okay? The same way with the ladies. So that'll be in the bulletin, and I'll have Carol put it in the bulletin, so it'll be in there all in November, okay? That's the 26th at 7 o'clock at the college chair. Thank you, and have a great Sabbath. As we begin our service this morning, I would invite you to bow your heads, bow your heads as those of us on the platform kneel to begin our service. Stand together as we sing our opening hymn, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. Still our refuge, take it to the Lord in prayer. Do your friends despise, forsake you, take it 
to the Lord in prayer. In his arms he'll take and shield you. You will find a solace there. Please be seated. Ancient words, God's word we can trust. Holy words long preserved for our walk in this world. They resound with God's own heart. Oh, let the ancient words impart. Words of life, words of hope, give us strength to help us cope. In this world where we roam, ancient worlds will guide us home. Ancient words ever true, changing me and changing you. We have come with open hearts, oh let the ancient words Holy words of our faith handed down to this age. Come to us through sacrifice, O head of faithful words of Christ. Ancient words long preserved for our walk in this world. They resound with God's own heart. Oh, let the ancient words impart. Ancient words ever true, changing me and changing you. We have come with open hearts. Oh, let the ancient words impart. We have come with, with open hearts. hearts. Oh, oh, let the ancient words impart. Our salvation is in Christ alone. Praise the Lord for Jesus Christ. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. Nights of love, what depths of peace. When fears are still, when striving cease. My comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless babe, this gift of love in righteousness, Scorned by the ones he came to save. In this love and righteousness. Scorned by the ones he came to save. Still on that cross as Jesus died. The love of God was satisfied. For every sin. On him was laid, here in the death of Christ I live. In the ground his body lay, light of the world by darkness slain. Then bursting forth in glorious day, 
But from the grave he rose again, and as he stands in victory, sin's curse had lost its grip on me. For I am his, and he is mine, bought with the precious blood of Christ. And living truth, this is the power of Christ in me. From life's fierce night to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand. Till he returns, or calls me turns, or calls me home, here in the power of Christ I stand. Is Jesus your all in all? everything for you. Let's sing. You are my strength when I am weak. You are the treasure that I seek. You are my all in all. Seeking you as a precious jewel, Lord, to give up, I'd be a fool. You are my all in all. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name. Jesus, Lamb of God. Taking my cross, my sin, my shame, raising again, I bless your name. You are my all in all. When I fall down, you pick me up. When I run dry, you fill my cup. You are my all in all. Jesus, Lamb of like to kneel with me in prayer. Lord, 
most holy Father in heaven. We want to thank you for the privilege of coming here to worship you. Lord, we've, I'm sure most of us have had a busy week, but we ask that your spirit would come into our hearts and kind of crowd out the cares and concerns of the world. Bring us back to your word. As we've read and as we've studied, as we've been thinking about what you've done for each one of us, that you would open our hearts, you'd open our minds and bring us healing. That you would talk to each one of us today and give us a, a purpose in your plan for each one of our lives. Lord, many of us, I think all of us, have friends and family that aren't here. And we want to remember them as well. That, Lord, whether through discouragement or, or ill health or doubt, Lord, that you would send your spirit to go and talk to them and, as only your wisdom knows how to reach their hearts. We'd ask that you would send and um, talk to them as well. As we begin service this morning. We just ask that you would, again, abide, abide in our hearts. Give us your thought. And let us hear your words in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning, our offering is for the local church budget, and the local mission field is where? Next door. It's the answer, what? Doodle? Castle Rock? It's the answer to the question, who is my neighbor? Right? Who is my neighbor, by the way? Who? Every human being, keep coming with that, in whom we have association or connection with, isn't it? That's our mission field. So sometimes it gets extended if we go to Nevada and visit friends and family. But primarily, our, our offering this morning is for our own local church budget here at Castle Rock to do what we can to bring the light of the gospel to our community and its surroundings. So with that, would the deacon stand for prayer? Lord, most holy Father in heaven, as we have opportunity to give back to you with some of what you've so kindly blessed us with, Lord, we just ask that not only would, you, would we give you our means, but that we would give you our hearts as well that we wouldn't just give an inanimate object, but that we would also send with it our thoughts, our prayers, our words and our actions, that we would participate in our local mission field just as well. Lord, we ask that you would take these means and use them wisely and efficiently. Sometimes in spite of us, it's easy to get short-sighted and to, to do things that might not be just the very best, but we just ask that you would govern these means to your intended purpose. In Jesus' most holy name, amen. Again, after our main offering, there will be some baskets that we pass through to the center aisle, and that's for our children to pick up if we have children here, but it goes to support three children that uh, we sponsor down in Central America. So that's what comes after our main offering.
Today we have one child in our church. His name is John. He is four months old, and his parents tell me that he's 99 percent tile in his growth at four months. So we're just thankful for baby John and for his parents, and Cody and Krista. So I'm going to still tell the children's story, but it'll be um, along the lines of an experience that I had in 1998 when I went back to Central America on a mission trip down to where I grew up from the age of two and a half to seven years old, to the first location of our Adventist hospital in Nicaragua. It was on the East Coast, which we call the Mosquito Coast, and we were right close to the ocean where the hospital was. You could see the ocean from our house. And um, we walked down to the beach, and when we get to the beach, there was a big uh, drop-off, like a cliff, but it had uh, steps built into the sandstone rock that we could climb down onto the beach. And uh, there was a little stream that came in from the side uh, into the uh, ocean at this point, and it was shallow places that you could cross to go to the main part of the beach. On the left, there was an outcropping of an extension of land that had a tunnel underneath. And we could swim over there and go through that tunnel uh, that had been opened up by the waves. And on top, you could look way down the coast south to where the dock was, uh, where the big ships would come in to take uh, lumber, pine lumber, from the area around. Uh, American companies were logging that area and they would put the lumber on these ships that were going to Germany to rebuild after the war, to rebuild Germany after the war. And so that was where my memories were. And when I went back there after 40 years, it was like deja vu. I was just awestruck with being in the place of my boyhood. I want to share a story. Later on, there was a construction that was made by the folks in the town uh, down that little bank. They built actually wooden steps and a little gazebo halfway down with, with benches and then steps on down to the beach. It was beautiful with railings and all. And I remember our church gathered at that location, all sitting up and down the steps and around that gazebo because that was the day there was a baptism down in that little creek that was coming into, into the o ocean. My father was the first elder, and we had a preacher who was from Jamaica, and he was the one leading out in the baptism, and we were all singing those hymns of baptismal uh, celebration. And uh, my father had been studying with one of his patients who was going to die. And he was bedridden. He couldn't get up out of his bed, but he wanted to be baptized. Now, do you believe that if he could not have been baptized that he would still have been saved? Absolutely. But he wanted to be baptized so badly. And my dad talked to the pastor and they arranged that he would be baptized by my dad and another helper carrying him on a stretcher down to the place of the baptism. And so here they came down the steps and one person had to hold it high, you know, hold the stretcher on one end high so that he wouldn't slide out as you go down the slips, and they went down by the creek, and the pastor and my dad picked up the stretcher and carried the man into the creek. And as they, as the pastor 
spoke those words, I now baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, my dad and the pastor, Lord the man on the stretcher and put it down under the water. The man was quite light in weight because he was dying. And my father didn't think about the physics of all of that and had not tied him to the stretcher. And so as they lowered the stretcher under the water, he was floating away with the current. And so I remember my dad letting go of the stretcher and the pastor's eyes as wide as saucers. My dad took the man and dunked him onto the stretcher underneath the water and then quickly grabbed the stretcher before he drowned the guy and pulled him back up and he was baptized that day. You know, don't you think the angels were laughing that day? I think they were. And they were rejoicing because this man wanted to follow Jesus. I want to follow Jesus. Whatever it takes, may Jesus help us all to follow him. Scripture reading for this morning is found in Hebrews chapter 4. If you'd like to turn, Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 to 16. Hebrews 4, 14 to 16. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed into the heavens. The Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. An enormous promise there, isn't there? The last three weeks, I think it has been, we've been having some evangelism meetings four nights a week. And before each of our main presentation um, presentations, we've had a little health talk. And so we want to kind of keep that going. And so Jeannie is going to give us a little health talk, and then Carol will bring to, to us our main message for this morning. So. That's how we will put it together again. Thank you. This morning, I'm going to be sharing with you on hydrotherapy. Did you know that there is a simple method of treatment, treatment for many troublesome ailments, one that is inexpensive? Too fast inexpensive and available in your own home. That method is hydrotherapy, the use of water in the treatment of various health conditions. It is one of the nature's simplest and most effective remedies. The Lord has supplied the natural world with remarkable health restoring agents, water, fresh air, sunlight, and a wide variety of healing herbs. To name a few, these natural remedies have several things in common. They are available to everyone. They can be easily incorporated into any home treatment plan. They are inexpensive. And they're highly effective for today's diseases. Many of the health benefits obtained from the external use of water are due to the, its cleansing properties. Washing clothes frequently removes dirt and impurities so that they will not be absorbed through the pores into the body placing a burden on the system. As basic as these principles are, they can have a profound impact on one's personal health. In addition to cleansing, water treatments can assist the body's efforts to heal infections, injuries, and a multitude of other discomforts and diseases. Here are some of the water's healing advantages. 
It has virtually no adverse side effects. It can be easily applied to a specific body part. Unlike many medicines, water treatments produce no toxins or waste products that burden the liver and the kidneys. Instead, it actually helps to eliminate toxins. The hot and cold contrast bath is one of the simplest and most effective water treatments. It consists of immersing any body part first in hot and then in cold water. Here is what happens to the body when hot and cold water is applied to the skin. The blood vessels widen when heat is applied and they narrow with the application of cold. This change in the blood vessel size increases circulation. More oxygen and nutrients are brought to the affected area and the removal of toxins and other waste products is sped up. As a result, there is more rapid healing. Here are a few common ailments greatly benefited by the use of the contrast bath. Infections, especially infections of the hands and the feet. Injuries to the muscle or joints. Arthritis, bone fractures, and swelling of the feet and the ankles. The contrast bath is so simple that it can be easily it can easily be done at home. Here is what you'll need. Two containers large enough to cover the body part, a tea kettle or pot of hot water, a pitcher of cold water or ice, and a towel to dry the area after completing the treatment. Before you begin the treatment, assemble your equipment and be sure that the room is warm and free from cold drafts. It's good to begin the treatment with a prayer for God's blessing. Test the hot water with your elbow. Be sure it's not too hot. The temperature should between, uh, be between 104 and 108, or 40 to 42 Celsius. Then immerse the body part completely in hot water for three minutes. After three minutes, transfer to the cold water bath for 30 seconds to one minute. Ice may be added for better contrast. For a complete treatment, simply repeat for three to five cycles of hot and cold, always finishing with cold. Keep the hot bath at the desired temperature by adding additional hot water as you need it. To receive the maximum benefit, it's wise to rest for 30 minutes after each hydrotherapy treatment before returning to your regular activities. Here are several precautions when giving a hot and cold bath. Instead of hot and cold, use only warm and cool baths if there is a loss of feeling. Or poor circulation to the legs and the feet. This is especially common in diabetes. For these people, it's very important to test the water temperature. As a general rule, when using your elbow, if you can leave your elbow Comfortably in the water, you may proceed with the treatment. And in the case of an infection, be sure to disinfect the equipment after treating an open sore or an infected wound. This will prevent the spread of infection. The contrast bath has helped many people regain their health without having to use harmful or inexpen excuse me, or expensive medications. This treatment can be given as needed several times a day. Let's take a moment to discuss another highly effective treatment, the contrast shower. This treatment acts as a healthy stimulant and an energizer, promoting good circulation and all around physical health. Sir Alexander Fleming, who discovered penicillin, made another very important discovery. He learned that in the secretions of the the nose and the throat, our body produces a natural antiseptic called lysozyme. When the secretions of the throat are slightly acid in reaction, this substance is active against invading germs. Helping to prevent colds, one of the best ways to keep these secretions slightly acid and to maintain an effective defense against colds 
is to take a daily hot and cold shower. Even patients who have been plagued with reoccurring colds for months have found this remedy effective. By taking a daily hot shower and ending with a quick cold shower, many were able to remain free from colds. How do you do it? The concept is really very simple. You switch back and forth between hot and cold water while showering. For example, on a daily basis, begin with a hot shower for several minutes. You want to be hot enough that it's going to feel good to cool off. Soap up and wash during this time. When finished, switch to the cold water for about 30 seconds to a minute, then dry off. You will find this very refreshing. I do this every day. As a treatment, the procedure is similar, but includes repetitions. After three minutes of hot water and 30 to 60 seconds of cold, then go back to a nice hot shower for another three minutes. It will feel great. Now get a little bit more aggressive. Switch to cold a little more quickly for a more rapid transition to a colder temperature. As you get used to contrast showers, you will be able to tolerate colder temperatures. For the best possible results, the changes from hot to cold should be abrupt. Repeat for three to five cycles of hot and cold. And remember, it's important to always finish with the cold and then dry off quickly. Some extra rest after the treatment is also helpful. The laws of nature, which God designed to govern the universe, also govern our human bodies, keeping them in harmonious working order. Living in harmony with the laws of our being is the surest way to prevent and restore physical health. Natural remedies are far more effective when God's health principles are practiced in the daily life. The following lifestyle habits work hand in hand with the healing water treatments eating nutritious food, drinking plenty of water, exercising outdoors in the fresh air and the sunshine, abstaining from harmful, harmful drugs such as alcohol, nicotine, and caffeine, and resting, getting proper rest. And the Sabbath rest is important too. Trusting in God, he is the great physician. The only true source of health and healing is the creator of mankind. Throughout history, God has often used natural remedies as his chosen means for the restoration of health. Water played an important part in one of the most notable healings recorded in the Bible. This story is recorded in 2 Kings chapter 5. On the recommendation of a little captive maid, Naaman the Syrian captain came with a letter to Israel's king seeking to be healed of his leprosy. To the distraught king, the prophet Elisha said, Let him come now to me, and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. When Naaman came to Elisha's door, he was directed to go wash in the Jordan River seven times, and your flesh will be restored. At first, Naaman was angry. He expected Elisha to call upon his God and heal him instantly. But when by faith he submitted to God's command and dipped in the Jordan water seven times, he was cleansed of his leprosy. Well, when ill, we, like Naaman, often desire immediate miraculous healing. Yet God often chooses to work in another way. Through simple natural remedies, through a wise use of these health-restoring agents, we, too, may experience the blessings of abundant health. And I like the pastor sharing this morning that story because baptism is kind of a little, a little uh, bit of hydrotherapy. Dying to self and coming up new in Christ. When's the last time you had to go to court? Not what I consider the highlight of my day ever. 
have a story for you this morning. The day he was to be hanged, the convict was served an evening meal of peas, bread, olives, and tea. At 8 p.m., he was informed that his appeal for a stay of execution had been denied. At midnight, he would die. The prison orderly bought him, brought him in a bottle of red wine. He drank half of it. As midnight approached, he was led to the third floor gallows. When asked if he wanted to wear a black hood, the prisoner said no. He was pronounced dead at 11.58 p.m. The body was cut down and cremated, the ashes strewn far out in the Mediterranean Sea. The date of that execution was May 31, 1962. Most of us can remember the year, perhaps, if not the exact date. The water took those charred remains the Mediterranean, the executioners, the Jews, the executed Nazi war criminal Adolf Eichmann. Now, Adolf Eichmann was a former oil company salesman, a salesman. He ran Hitler's final solution. Millions of people, men, women, and children, were murdered without mercy through the diligence of this icy German bureaucrat. Here's a perplexing question. To hang a man who killed millions in the same way, to hang him if he killed just one, now how can that be justice? It can't be, and it wasn't. Frankly, what court could give the kind of justice that was deserved in a case like that? Only God can do that. The Bible tells us that he will. Ecclesiastes 12.14 says, For God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. I don't know about you, but I think I've undoubtedly got some things back here that I've never told anybody about and don't ever want to. That's between God and me. Tonight's extremely important subject is about God's final judgment and how it affects you and me. One thing especially I want you to remember, in God's court, your Heavenly Father is the judge. Your older brother, Jesus, who died for you, is your defense attorney. What a concept. If you've accepted Jesus as your Savior and your Lord, You have absolutely nothing to worry about when you have your day in court. The Bible tells us we will have that day in court. For we all must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he's done, whether good or bad. 2 Corinthians 5.10 Years ago, a prominent philosopher wrote that if you believed only one thing, God is just, then he had to believe in some sort of final judgment that would be handed out in the afterlife, because there's often no justice in this life. I mean, where's the justice for those who carried out the Holocaust? Where's the justice for those who caused the massacres in Rwanda? Where's the justice for Pol Pot and his henchmen who massacred more than a million on the killing fields of Cambodia? I've read a first-person story about those killing fields that took those people five years of wandering around to finally get to a place of safety. I can't imagine that. Where's the justice for those who stole Africans and sold them into slavery? Well, my answer to you today is that judgment is coming. The Bible is clear. God will mete out the final judgment, and it is absolutely fair and just, never distorted by personal opinions or political viewpoints. Then we, with others, will be able to shout, Even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are your judgments. Revelation 16, 7. 
First notice with me this text. Now this is Jesus talking. And behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me, to give to everyone according to his work. Revelation 22, 12. This text implies some kind of judgment prior to the second coming of Jesus. And it'd have to be, wouldn't it? After all, if when Jesus returns, his reward is with him, it must have been determined before he arrived. Now, God knows who his faithful are and who they aren't. All this is disclosed once for all in the judgment. Which leads to the question, why have judgment at all? If God knows everything, why a judgment? The answer is, God doesn't need judgment. He knows everything. But God is not alone in this universe. We said a few nights ago about the great controversy that began among angels in heaven itself. Can you imagine a war in heaven? We noted how that great spiritual conflict was transferred here to earth. You remember these words from Revelation 12, and war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought, but they did not prevail. Nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old, called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Revelation 12, verses 7 to 9. No wonder the Bible can say we've been made a spectacle to the world, both to angels and to men. That's 1 Corinthians 4, 9. Or look at this statement from the New Testament. His intent was that now through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. That's from the NIV version, uh, Ephesians 3.10. The idea is that wisdom and fairness of God should be made known to those on other worlds throughout the universe. Which means they're learning about the character of God by watching the controversy between good and evil on our rebellious planet. See, we've already settled it for ourselves. We've already sinned. But the universe will learn through all this that God, in fact, is the one being judged. He is the one who will be found fair and just for all eternity. They're learning about the character of God by watching this controversy on this rebellious planet, and why not? According to Scripture, the issues regarding sin and evil evil, aren't just limited to earth. On the contrary, the whole great controversy between the forces of good and evil began in another part of the universe. Thus, the universe has a stake in this matter. I'm glad about that, aren't you? Aren't you tired of living in a world of sickness, sadness, and death? I sure am. Getting awfully tired of watching good friends die. I'm glad, too, that one day this is all going to end. Because you see, at the cross, Jesus conquered Satan. Small note, does that not make Satan a defeated foe? A toothless rattlesnake? The Bible makes it clear that because Jesus sacrificed on the cross, you and I can have eternal life, and sin, Satan, and his fallen fallen angels will be destroyed in a lake of fire. Now, we naturally think that the judgment's all about us, but that's only partially true. Those who have accepted Jesus eagerly await his well done, thou good and faithful servant. Matthew 25 21. However, judgment isn't only about us, it's about God. Was he fair? Was he just? Did he do everything possible to save each of us? These questions are answered in the judgment that precedes Jesus' return to planet Earth. The Bible says even those who reject the salvation God offers will admit in the end that 
God's verdict is just. As we continue studying the judgment, we're going to discover not only why God has judgment, but when it will begin. With these points in mind, let's look at the famous text from John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. There's a story about a bridge tender. And one day, he'd taken this little five-year-old boy with him to work. And as the train loaded with commuters was approaching the bridge, the bridge had been open for a ship to go under. And as he was about to close the bridge, he looked out the window and he saw his five-year-old leaning over the edge of the bridge. And if he closed it, his baby would die. He didn't have a choice. He closed the bridge. And as those people in that train went whizzing by, they were totally oblivious to the sacrifice that had just been made. Everlasting life as opposed to what? Everlasting death. With so much at stake, God is going to have a judgment that makes it clear that he is just and fair and merciful to every one of us. So read the Bible's clearest description of judgment. Let Daniel now describe the spectacular events for us. I watched till thrones were put in place and the Ancient of Days was seated. His garment was white as snow and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame, its wheels burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. A thousand thousands ministered to him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated and the books were open. Daniel 7 verses 9 and 10. And if we read on in the vision, it becomes clear that following this judgment, Jesus returns. Clearly this is the judgment which takes place just before Jesus returns. Notice the words, the court was seated. What does court make you think of? Judgment, of course. A trial with evidence presented. In the judgment, we see the Ancient of Days, God himself. In the Bible, books were often used in judgment, as we see right here. Revelation 20, verse 12 says, And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. So it's clear here, we're looking at some kind of heavenly court where judgment's about to take place. The Ancient of Days, God himself. Before we continue, let's make sure one thing is perfectly clear. Not one of us facing this judgment is worthy of eternal life. So it's pretty wonderful when in this court, when many of the records come before the judge of the universe, we find the word pardoned after the name. How can that be? Because these people have asked Jesus to forgive their sins and become Lord of their lives. What an amazing transaction by God on our behalf. No wonder the Apostle Paul can say, thanks be to God for his unspeakable gift. So essential is this drama to describe how God deals with the sin problem in his universe that he gave his people an object lesson through the earthly sanctuary where their sins would be dealt with. Let's take a walk through that court, that sanctuary, the first large courtyard surrounded by a high linen fence in the courtyard was the altar. Here's where the animals were brought. Lambs, goats, calves, oxen, even birds to be sacrificed. 
when someone committed sin, they brought an animal to be killed. God allowed animals to be killed instead of the guilty sinner. The sacrificed animals were also symbols of Jesus, that true Lamb of God. After the animal was killed, the priest take its blood into the earthly sanctuary. And in a sense, the blood carried away the sin of the guilty person. Their sin figuratively transferred to the animal, which died in their place. The priest then brought the blood into the sanctuary so the sinner could be forgiven and freed from the penalty of their sin. As we'll see in a moment, this happens in the heavenly sanctuary too. The earthly sanctuary had two rooms, the holy place and the most holy place. It is here in the holy place that priests ministered each day on behalf of the people. Once a year, however, there was a special service. It was called the Day of Atonement. I like that word, at one meant. On this special day, the high priest went into the second apartment, the most holy place. Here in that room was a beautiful golden chest, wooden chest, I'm sorry, covered in gold. It was called the Ark of the Covenant and contained a copy of the Ten Commandments. I wondered about that at first. Copy of the Ten Commandments. You remember the original was broken and God had to replace it for Moses. Above the Ark of the Covenant was the glorious presence of God. It was called the Day of Atonement and on this special day the high priest went into the second apartment, the most holy place. But once a year the high priest went into the most holy place bringing the blood of sacrifice with which to cleanse the sanctuary. But why go into the most holy place once a year? Because the priest bringing blood in the sanctuary would make the sanctuary unclean. The blood was laden with the sins of the people. So now the sanctuary itself had been cleansed. This cleansing of the sanctuary was also known as the great day of judgment. In the Jewish religion, it was understood to be the day when every person's case was decided, either for or against God. Yes, this yearly cleansing of the sanctuary was a symbol of the day of judgment. Today we know when Jesus was sacrificed at the cross, all those symbols met their fulfillment. The whole earthly sanctuary service was no longer needed. This is seen most dramatically when at the death of Jesus, the veil which separated the holy place from the most holy place was torn in half, showing that the earthly service had lost all meaning. The Bible puts it this way, and Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. I want you to picture for a moment a man outstretched on the cross, both hands nailed down, his feet nailed down. And he's going to suffocate if they give him enough time hanging there. He can't get a breath. Jesus cried out with a loud voice. Now that's got to be supernatural. For a man in that physical position would not have been able to cry out with a loud voice. And then he yielded up his spirit. These people didn't kill him, folks. He gave it up of his own free will. And then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from the top to the bottom. Less than 40 years later, this point was brought home even more vividly when Roman armies under General Titus invaded Jerusalem and burned the temple to the ground. That had been predicted, but you know, when Titus came in, he saw that beautiful building, that beautiful temple, and he told them not to, not to harm it. They weren't to touch it. But they had had such a time with this whole thing that they ran amok and they burned it to the ground. But now here's the exciting thing. Though the earthly temple was destroyed, God still has a sanctuary in heaven, just like the one which the 
on which the earthly sanctuary is modeled. Now this is the main point of things we're saying. We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle which the Lord erected and not man. Hebrews 8, verses 1 and 2. Humans built the, the earthly sanctuary, but God built the one in heaven where Jesus is ministering now on our behalf. When we pray to Jesus, our high priest in the heavenly sanctuary, Let me suggest another way of looking at that judgment scene. How would you feel if you had to go to court because something wrong you'd done? When you got there, you found out your older brother was your defense attorney. Now, this is assuming you had a good relationship with your older brother. And the judge was your father. You'd be encouraged, wouldn't you? Well, this is exactly the way it is in judgment for anyone everyone who accepted Jesus. The Bible tells us, for Christ has not entered the holy place made with hands, which are copies of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Hebrews 9.24. Notice, Christ hasn't entered into the holy place made with hands. No. He entered into the one in heaven itself where he represents us in the very presence of God the Father. Yes, Jesus represents us in heaven as he pleads, not with the blood of an animal, but the merits of his own bloodshed, so that you and I could have forgiveness for our sins. Have you sinned recently? Have you done something wrong? Have you broken God's law? One small elaboration there. To be unloving toward another person is breaking God's law. To look at someone else and judge them as less than you. And that's a very human tendency to try to find somebody to look down on. That's a transgression of God's law. And it's dangerous ground, my friends. Jesus represents us in heaven as he pleads not the blood of an animal but the merits of his own blood shed so that you and I have, can have forgiveness for those sins. I have good news for you. You don't need to sacrifice an animal to pay the price for your sins. No. The sacrifice has already been offered. The price has already been paid by Jesus. Just claim for yourself by faith that sacrifice I mean somebody gives you a gift if you don't take it you don't have the gift this is a gift he has given us 2,000 years ago say Jesus I accept you tonight as my Savior and Lord and it is that simple we always try to complicate things always trying to complicate they can't be that simple you know it is that simple, people. Then you, too, will have Jesus representing you in that heavenly court. Now, I've got a question for you. We'll learn from Daniel 7 that judgment happens before Jesus returns. How can we know when that judgment actually takes place? Can we know? We can. Daniel answers that question for us in Daniel 8 and 9. Daniel 8.14 is the key text, and let's read it. For 2,300 days, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. Right in the middle of Daniel's description of the judgment is this time prophecy that tells when it begins. If we unlock that prophecy, we'll have the answer to our question, so let's unlock it for right now. First, let's remember the important key to understanding Bible prophecy is the fact that a day in Bible prophecy represents a year. That's why we read statements in the Bible like Numbers 14.34 that refers to a day for a year. Or, I've laid on you each day for a year in Ezekiel 4.6. Again, a day represents a year in Bible prophecy. So let's put the key in the lock. 
Our prophecy in Daniel 8.14 speaks about 2,300 days. That means what? 2,300 years. So after 2,300 years, judgment was to begin in heaven. But from when? should be easy to discover when 2,300 years end, if we can learn when it begins. Fortunately, we can discover when it begins right in Daniel's prophecy itself. But then an angel sent from heaven who says, I have come to tell you, therefore, consider the matter and understand the vision. Daniel 9.23. What vision? The vision of the 2,300 years, which he didn't understand. Yeah, Daniel needed help the same way we do. And he got it. So the angel begins telling Daniel that the first part of the prophecy concerns his own people, the Jews. Seventy weeks are determined or cut off for your people, Daniel 9.24. The helpful part of that explanation, as we see, is that 70 weeks, which is to be cut off from the 2,300 days, does have a starting point and we know when it is. The angel Gabriel gives Daniel the 70-week prophecy, the one we looked at in our last study. He then gives him the starting point. And that starting point is the command to restore and build Jerusalem, rebuild Jerusalem, which was destroyed by the Babylonians decades earlier. Now know from both the Bible and history, this command was issued in the year 457 B.C., and this date is firmly established in history. So notice here we have 70-week prophecy, which is a starting point from the command and restore, rebuild Jerusalem. This date was 457 B.C. We know when that period begins. That 70-week period was probationary time for the Jewish people to make their response to the coming Messiah. Daniel 8.14 says, For 2,300 days... Then the sanctuary should be cleansed. If we look all the numbers that we looked at last night again tonight, it looks like this. There's two ways to do it. In a previous lesson, we came to the end of the 70 weeks to 34 AD, the first 490 years. Then we add 1,810 years more, and we arrive at 1844. Or we can go directly from 457 B.C., add the 2,300 years, and arrive once again at 1844. This is the date that God's final judgment began. This is the judgment that leads to the second coming of Jesus. Now notice something important with me. Why did God directly, what did God directly link this judgment with? With a 70-week prophecy, right? That prophecy was especially about Jesus' death in our behalf. So if we've accepted Jesus as our Savior, we have nothing to fear in this judgment. Not because we never sin, but because Jesus didn't sin. Instead, he died on that cross. An innocent Lamb of God, slain from the foundation of the world. This is the great judgment depicted in Daniel 7, which we read earlier. It is also the judgment spoken of in Revelation 14, 7, where we read, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea, and the springs of water. Just as the high priest on the earthly day of judgment went into the most holy place, Christ our great high priest, went into the most holy place and began his work of judgment. But, you say, this has been more than 150 years ago. How could the judgment take that long? Well, for us, 150 years is a long time. But for God, who has always existed, what's 150 years? 2 Peter 3.8 says, But, beloved, Do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as one day. If a thousand years is a day to God, what's 150 years to him? Nothing. The important point is, this judgment signals us that we are indeed living in the time of the end. 
what Daniel talked about. The judgment hour message is another way for God to tell us that Jesus is coming back soon. We need to be ready because the Bible tells us that we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. The judgment hour message, which began in 1844, is another example of our merciful God calling us to decide for him because judgment's going on right now. But friends, remember, the judgment is good news. If you've accepted Jesus as your Savior and Lord, you can rest assured that your name is written in the God's book of life. When judgment concludes, all is done for eternity. Then God will stand vindicated before the universe. All creation will see the devil as a liar and a deceiver. And the universe will also see God as merciful and just. Yes, this good news of the judgment provides. Since 1844, the message has been going around the world that God's judgment has begun. That time to get ready for Jesus' return has come. There's only one way to get ready for Jesus' return, and that's to accept him into our lives. When we do, Jesus becomes our Savior and our friend in court, our advocate. Could you stand before God on the merits of your deeds with every secret thing revealed? I couldn't. That's why I want Jesus to be there for me. Do you want him to be there for you as your Savior and friend? Your answer to that great question will determine your eternal destiny. Why not make your choice right now for Jesus, for life in all its fullness? More than 180 years ago in the early days of America, a group of pioneers were heading west in covered wagons. As they approached a vast prairie, they woke up one day to a frightful sight. A whole wall of smoke arose in front of them to the west. A great wildfire was heading their way. There was no way they could turn around and avoid it because it was coming toward them so fast. Panic set in. What could they do? Finally, the leader said, Quick, burn the grass behind us. Hurry, let's set it on fire. So they did just that. And after the space was burned, they moved the whole company onto that burned space. As the flames came toward them from the west, the little girl, full of fright, cried out to the leader, Are you sure we will not be burned up? He looked at her and he answered, The flames cannot reach us here, for we are standing where the fire has already been. Friends, 2,000 years ago at the cross, Jesus went where the flames were. He died there to save us. So when you go to Jesus, you have nothing to fear in the judgment because the flames that should fall on you have already fallen on Jesus. Won't you right now make the choice to go to Jesus? Would you all join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, we understand better than ever now that time is short and we must get ready to meet Jesus. The judgment hour message is being proclaimed. Help us to go to the cross where the flames have been and give ourselves to Jesus. Thank you for such a clear picture of who you are and what you've done for us. Oh Lord, our hearts cry out. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? Jesus, we accept you right now as our Savior and Lord. Please come back soon so that we can be with you forever. We pray in your precious name. Amen.
next slides, please. Jesus paid it all. Savior say, thy strength in thee is gone. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Turn in me, thine all in all. Jesus paid it. Father, bless us as we leave this place. May your spirit go with us. We thank you for the great gift of your son, Jesus Christ, and of that hope we have of his soon return and that we can stand pure before him through his righteous mercy. Thank you for hearing our prayer in Jesus' name.